been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me Have you ever faced a giant? Have you ever had a giant pop up in your life? I've had not just one giant, I've had several giants pop up in my life, and they're always formidable. They're always tough. They're always hard. They're always scary. They always seem insurmountable. They always seem like I'm not going to make it. I'm going to lose the battle, and I'm sure you face that same thing as well. Well, today's title and passage is, Are You Defeating Your Goliaths? Are you defeating your Goliath? We're going to be talking about David and Goliath today. A lot of us as children grew up with that story in Bible school. And then as adults, you've probably no more read through that uh, passage in your quiet times many times. All of us tend to understand that wonderful story about David and Goliath. David going up against a giant. And I'm hoping that we will see some spiritual principles from this Old Testament story that you can take into your life and you can end up fighting the giants in your life and find yourself on the victory side just as David did. If you want to, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, and we're going to start in verse 1. And uh, we're going to read this story about this young boy. Let me set up the story for you. David is somewhere around 14 or 15 years old. And we get that because to go into Saul's army, you had to be 20 years of age or older. And so there were eight sons, and the three oldest of the eight sons were already in the military. And they weren't twins, so you probably had a uh, 22-year-old, a 21-year-old, a 20-year-old. And then you had five more kids, and David is the youngest. So that would put him somewhere around 14 or 15 years old. With that background, let's go into God's Word. 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and they camped between Soko and Azekah and Esphim Damim. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Let me tell you what that is. If you had a cubit that was 18 inches, you really could measure from your tip of your middle finger to here. So there's your 18 inches. And a span is anything from your thumb to your finger. So 18 and a span, that would have made him nine feet, nine inches tall. And Israelis are very short people. Israelites were short people. And this is a nine foot, nine inch giant. Verse 5, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. That 600 shekels amounted to a 15-pound spearhead. That was not the entire spear. The spearhead made of iron weighed 15 pounds just by itself. And this shield barrier who also walked before them. By the way, they speculate that the entire spear that he carried was 37 pounds. 15 pounds being at the iron tip where he had the iron head. Verse 8. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, you got to remember, these are adults, they're men, they're trained, and they're warriors. And yet, every one of them were dismayed and greatly afraid, even King Saul. Verse 12, now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. The three older sons of Jesse had gone after Saul 
to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the second to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. Now the three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock at Bethlehem. The Philistine came forward morning and evening for 40 days and took his stand. For a month and a half, this giant came in the morning and at night, and he had all of the army of Israel, which is the army of God, dismayed and very afraid, even King Saul. So verse 17, Then Jesse said to David his son, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this roasted grain and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. Bring also these ten cuts of cheese to the commander of their thousand and look into the welfare of your brothers and bring back news of them. For Saul and they and all the men of Israel are in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David arose early in the morning and left the flock with a keeper and took the supplies and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out to battle array shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle array, army against army. Then David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines and spoke these same words, and David heard them. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. The men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel, meaning free of taxes. The king and all of these men, they're so wanting this, this champion for the Philistines to be killed. Hey, I'll give you great riches. I'll give you my daughter. I'll make it to where your father doesn't have to pay taxes. Just somebody come kill the guy. Okay, we've been out here 40 days and 40 nights. We're struck with terror. I will really reward the person that can kill him. Verse 26, Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will we be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? The people answered him in accord with this word, saying, Thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. But David said, What have I done now? Was it not just a question? Any of you ever had siblings that just really gave you a hard time? You're trying to do the right thing and your siblings just give you a really hard time? Well, that's what David was sensing. Verse 30, then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing. And the people answered the same thing as before. When the words were, which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul and he sent for him. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him your servant will go and fight with this Philistine then Saul said to David you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are but a youth while he has been a warrior from his youth but David said to Saul your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth and when he rose up against me I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who has delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with armor. David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David took them off. He took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even in his pouch. And his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. 
When the Philistine looked and saw David, the, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God. In Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, but the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and had killed him, but there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the slain Philistines lay along the way to Sharim, even to Gath and Ekron. The sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camps. Then David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his weapons in his tent. Now when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner! Whose son is this young man? And Abner said, By your life, O king, I do not know. The king said, You inquire whose son the youth is. So when David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the Philistine's head in his hand. Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Oh, isn't that just a great sermon? Oh, I'm telling you, that's just so awesome. This is a rock that I actually picked up in the riverbed from the Valley of Elah. When I went to Israel in 2007, 2008, I was standing there, and this was where the Philistines were camped in battle array. Here's where the Israelites came up in battle array, and here's that little stream right there. And I just reached down, and I picked this up, and I put it in my pocket, put it in my suitcase, and I brought it back to the States. Right? So this is right out of that riverbed. So he picked up five smooth stones. You know what stands out to me? He didn't need but one. He didn't need the other four. I don't know if they were insurance or if he just wanted to have more, but he didn't need them. God was already upon him, and God just wanted him to be faithful and obedient. Here you've got trained adult men that are trained for battle, that are certainly not as scared and fearful as maybe a teen might be, and they are out there 40 days and 40 nights. In the morning and at the night, they are dismayed, and they are greatly afraid, the text says. And then this little boy comes up with cheese and crackers. And he's actually bringing some cheese and crackers, and his dad just sent him to check on him. He goes out there to talk to him, and his brother said, oh, you just wanted to come see the battle. You think somebody's a little jealous, like, hey, you wanted to come see the fight that we're not fighting? <laughs> Nobody's fighting anybody, right? Now, the king, everybody looks to the king. Listen, if the king would take out out there and fight, so would his men. But if the king won't go fight, you're not going to go fight, right? And so everybody's looking for the king. Well, the king is just shaking in his boots. And so everybody else is shaking in his boots. David comes up. And he gets these stones from the riverbed, and he goes out there, and he actually talks to Goliath. First of all, he talks to his brothers, and he talks to the men in the army. Then he actually talks to Saul, and then he actually goes out and talks to God. I want to talk to you a little bit about what's in this book entitled uh, Facing Your Giants, Max Lucado. I want you to hear how Max Lucado summarizes this up. And had he not said this, I probably wouldn't have drawn this from the text. Listen to what Max Lucado says. Giants. We must face them, yet we need not face them alone. Focus first and most on God. The times David did, giants fell. The days he didn't, David fell. 
Test this theory with an open Bible. Read 1 Samuel 17 and list the observations David made regarding Goliath. I find only two. One statement to Saul about Goliath, verse 36, and one to Goliath's face. Who is this uncircum Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Verse 26. That's it. Two Goliath-related comments, and tacky ones at that, and no questions. No inquiries about Goliath's skill, age, social standing, or IQ. David asks nothing about the weight of the spear, or the size of the shield, or the meaning of the skull and the crossbones tattooed on the giant's bicep. David gives no thought to this Diplodocus of the hill, zilch. But he gives much thought to God. Read David's words again. This time, underlining his references to his Lord. The armies of the living God, verse 26. The armies of the living God, verse 36. The Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, verse 45. The Lord will deliver you into my hand that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, verse 46. The Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands, verse 47. I count nine references. God's thoughts outnumber Goliath's thoughts nine to two. How does this ratio compare with yours? Do you ponder God's grace four times as much as you ponder your guilt? Is your list of blessings four times as long as your list of complaints? Is your mental file of hope four times as thick as your mental life of dread? Are you four times as likely to describe the strength of God as you are the demands of your day? No? Well, then David is your man. Some note the absence of miracles in the story. No Red Sea openings. No chariots flaming. No dead Lazarus walking. No miracles. But there is one. David is one, a rough-edged, walking wonder of God who neon lights this truth. Focus on giants, you stumble. Focus on God, your giants stumble. Lift your eyes, giant slayer. The God who made a miracle out of David stands ready to make one out of you and me. I don't know about you, but I don't like my giants taking me down. I don't know if that's just the male part of me, but I don't like my giants taking me down. What kind of giants are you facing? What about the giants of depression? Giant of anxiousness. Giant of fear. Giant of loss of a job. Giant of bad self-image. Giant of not having enough finances. The giant of separation and divorce. The giant of, and you fill in the blank. What are your giants? There is no way to live on this planet earth and not encounter giants. All of us want to be able to live a peace-filled life. The good life. A relaxed life. A safe life. Watch the news. You can watch it 10 a.m. in the morning, 12 at noon. You watch it 5 and 6 and 8 and also 10 p.m. And then you can get it on other stations like CNN 24-7. Just look around. There are giants all around. We've got other nations that want to attack our nation. And then other nations want to attack other nations, right? So we've got nation against nation. We've got people against people. Sometimes we have family against family. Sometimes best friends against best friends. Sometimes church members against church members. There's always a giant right around the corner. Always a giant. And also, this is something interesting to me. Goliath was not even David's enemy. He was not David's giant. David made him his giant. David could have just dropped off the crackers and cheese and gotten on his little donkey and gone all the way back to the sheep and gone into the pasture. And if you remember, David is one that wrote Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He could have gone back and had God led him by the still waters. He could have driven up and said, Whoa, this does not look good. I am out of here. Here's your crackers and cheese. And then left. All of those men in the army, don't know how many hundreds of men or thousands of men were in that army and the king, that was their giant. They were stopped dead in their tracks with their giant. Somebody walks up and it's not even their giant. He's looking around and saying, what's wrong with you people? 
What in the world is wrong with you people? He just defied the army of Israel. He just defied our God. He's taunting us. We are Israel. We know the Lord God in the heavens. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Come on, men. What are you doing? This is a 14 or 15-year-old boy. You ever wonder if non-Christians or really weak baby Christians are looking around at the Christian church today going, What are y'all doing? What are you doing? The church was not ordained and instituted by God to gather together and play bingo. What are you doing? We are the army of God. We are here to take back spiritual kingdom souls. When we share the gospel, people come to faith. But you know, a lot of times the church is ineffective because most of the time the believers can't take care of their daily giants in their life. I hear it all the time. Well, pastor, you don't understand. I got to do this. Pastor, you don't understand. I got this problem. Pastor, you don't understand. I can't, I can't do what God's called me to do over here because I got these giants over here that I can't really defeat. Would love to do what you're telling me over here, but I got this problem. God didn't love David any more than he loves me and you. What we really need today is to become David's. We got enough King Saul's. We got enough King Saul's. We got enough people just being the Israelite army, but not at their post. They're at their post, but they're not doing anything. Could that whole army have rushed out and taken that champion? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if their God was the Lord God in the heavens that David knew, why could a boy who's not an adult, who's not trained, who's not even enlisted, who doesn't have any armor, who doesn't have a javelin, a spear, or a bow, or a knife, only a slingshot and a stone, how can he possibly turn the tide? He couldn't. God can. God can. I feel like in our day, the Christian church knows that God can, but that he doesn't still do that. Somebody else agree? That believers believe in the God that opened the Red Sea. The God that brought those plagues. The God that strengthened David to take down Goliath. And then on and on and on. That God used to do that. If the church today only believes that our God was moving in power back there and that he's impotent today, we will be absolutely unfruitful. Absolutely unfruitful. This sits in my office at home on my shelf to remind me. I mean, it's real. It is a stone from the riverbed in Elah where I stood where that young boy took out a nine-foot, nine-inch guy without the traditional weaponry simply because God was with him. Is God with you? Is he? If he is, you ought to be bearing a lot of spiritual fruit. As we go through this sermon series on David, we started in the middle with David and Goliath, but we're going to go back and find out what does it take to be a man after God's own heart. Did you know God didn't say that about the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter? He didn't say it about Samuel. He didn't say it about Moses. He didn't say anything like that about any other person, Old or New Testament, a man after my own heart. So David had a heart like God. He had a heart that chased after God. Did he make a lot of mistakes and did he sin? Absolutely. And we're going to talk about that later in the sermon series as to what caused this man who used to be a giant killer, how did he become a marriage killer? How did he become a husband killer? How did he become a Jerusalem killer? Because Jerusalem really suffered. His family suffered. How did this man that took out this giant fail here? But what got him to the point that he could slay Goliath? What's back here? You don't just walk in and start to slay a nine-foot, nine-inch giant who has been trained for war all of his life. We need to go back in the coming weeks, and we need to go back and look and say, what was going on in this 14 or 15-year-old's life? What was going on that he had the power and the presence of God upon him to the point he could slay giants? Normally, 14, 15-year-olds are just 
not even learning to drive yet. How could he do what thousands of trained men and the king, what could, what possibly happened? We're going to go back and we're going to find out what made him this strong boy. Now remember, he's not a man yet. He's not a man yet. What made this strong of a boy? There has to be something in his past. And you know what the beautiful thing is? Please make sure you come the next few weeks. Because you're going to find that everything that David did, said, and acted upon was what God was doing in his daily life, in the daily routines of life. Where you and I waste a lot of time during those routines, David wasn't wasting those opportunities. David was drawing near to God so that when he had a giant to face, he took him out. Amen? What giant do you have in front of you today? You know, and unfortunately, sometimes you might have three giants. Do you have two giants, three giants, four giants? And I'm here to tell you, I have giants in my life, and they're breathing down my neck, and they're making taunts, and they seem insurmountable, and it just seems like I'm going to be defeated. I'm not going to make it. But I'm going to trust in the name of the Lord my God. God is my refuge. God is my strength. And he said, therefore, I should not be afraid, Psalms 46. I don't have to live afraid. There is nothing, and we sang in one of the songs earlier, there is nothing, no weapon formed against me that can stand. Nowhere by anybody, as long as I'm really connected to the heart and the presence and the protection of God. I want to go with God. Have you just been going alone? We talked about it in the adult Bible study this morning. Have you ever heard people say, well, I've done all I can. All I can do now is pray. All I can do is pray to the Almighty God, which the Bible says nothing is impossible with Him, and He has all protection, all provision, cattle on a thousand hills, and He is the one that created all of this land and the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that lives and breathes on it and swims in the oceans, and He created us, and He's the one that opened the Red Sea. I mean, all I can do is pray to Him and see if my, He might can do something. God is not your last resort. He is your first choice and refuge. And David knew that. David showed up on that battlefield with a confidence that those other, and those are believers. Most of those men are believers. This is Israel we're talking about. We're not talking about the Philistines or the Hittites or Amorites. We're not talking about them. This is Israel. They believed in God. They were saved. They knew God. God was their father. They didn't have confidence and power. One person on that field that day had a confidence in God. What a shame to the adults. What a shame to the king that a 14-year-old boy. And by the way, did you see how he came to, Philist to the Philistine, the champion? He said, the battle is not won by spears and swords and javelins because they have all of that. He didn't even borrow one of theirs to take him out. And God told us how big of a spear he had, 37-pound spear, 15-pound end on it. But he didn't use any of that. He just used a stone from the riverbed. You know why? Because all he needed was God. All he needed was God. I'm here to tell you that for you and for me, the only thing that we need to take down our giants, whatever they are, is God and God alone. God and God alone. Do you believe that? Or do you believe that's just something that used to happen in biblical times? Is our God still sovereign? Is he still almighty? Is he still our protector? Is he still our father? Is he still able to do the impossible? Then we need to act like it. We need to act like it. Let's stand and let's worship Christ.